as Steve said, I'm the um, sheep and goat specialist at MSU. And uh, as an overview, I'm going to talk about annual uh, forages, mostly in sheep grazing systems. A considerable amount of what I'm going to talk about is going to be on cover crops. However, annuals kind of can be used in a little bit different context of crop rotation systems as well. So I'll touch on that, especially in the beginning. I'll you know give you some good practical information, hopefully, on crop choices and the rationale behind that. Um, a little bit on grazing management of cover crops and annuals, and then kind of the infrastructure requirements that that you you're going to want, which are pretty minimal, really. And then an important consideration for any livestock is making sure their water needs are met happily that's done kind of just with forage water content really with cover crops given given that we're often grazing them in cool weather and i'll cover that pretty thoroughly so as far as sheep grazing programs are concerned with annual forages uh, there's a couple different um, definitions i guess uh, you could consider an annual forage rotation within a sheep farm grazing program so if you're a grazier um, putting annual forages into your grazing program is a nice way to um, have a more diverse forage base and extend your grazing season and do a bunch of good things I'll discuss. And then we have, on the other hand, we also have cover crop opportunities that can be within a you know diversified sheep production system where the, the farm also has cash crops. Or as I'll describe, um, a lot of the work I've done, even on my own personal farm, is in partnership with a crop farm. You know, there aren't really a whole lot of livestock farms um, in the country relative to maybe what we saw, especially smaller farms we saw um, decades ago, but there is a whole lot of crop production and there's a good opportunity for uh, livestock, especially sheep, to partner with some of the, with farms and create a nice synergy for, that benefits everybody. Um, so I just thought I'd just give an overview that a challenge that we have in forage production systems for sheep, however, is that, you know, we, we first of all, anytime you have a forage system and you own land, you're trying to really optimize the utilization of your forage. And certainly annual forages can help with that. Um, and they can also help fill the needs of highly productive animals. If we're gonna make money, with sheep in under current market conditions, generally that's gonna equate with increasing their productivity. We increase their productivity, the question always, the challenge is, you know, if we wanna forage a more of a forage-based system, how are we gonna do that? And some of the annual forages are part of an answer to that question, to that challenge. We can also lower the cost of production, um, certainly improve soil and land carrying capacity. People who have put annuals into their rotation I've seen pretty dramatic increases in the um, number of sheep that can carry. And of course, by feeding your animals better and um, having a higher plane of nutrition, you're gonna improve animal welfare and health. And especially, you know, one of the big challenges we have with sheep um, in, in our climate, uh, I say our climate, Iowa's not too terribly different in Michigan, is parasites. So parasite management's enhanced with the use of annual forages. So this diversification uh, with annuals helps fill in some deficits that we'd see in a typical pasture production. You know, most of the cool season grass that you guys would be growing in Iowa or in Michigan, like 60 per 70 percent of that's going to be happening early in the season. Then you're going to have kind of a summer slump period, which can be kind of dramatic on a droughty year. And then of course we have a long winter. So um, how can we extend the grazing season and reduce our use of stored forage? Um, annuals help us do that. The quality of the um, annual forages that we can put into our systems can also be super high compared to some of the perennial plants that we use. Um, so that can help fill in some gaps in forage quality for late lactation, or excuse me, late pregnancy and lactation of sheep with high nutrient requirements that are raising a lot of lambs, or even growing lambs. You know, when you want to feed for growth, you need a high plane of nutrition, and this th these certainly help meet that need, and I'll describe that a little bit. We also have an opportunity to lower the infectivity of our pastures 
by essentially resting them by putting them through an annual um, forage system. And then, of course, we improve the productive capacity of the land, um, which I'll describe and give you kind of a case study here in a minute, where we can replace our low productivity pastures, um, renovate them, for example. Now, I'm giving, in this context, I'm talking about pasture renovation. We could also fit these into, say you have a vegetable cropping um, program or, you know, you're, you're a vegetable farmer. They can also fit in rotation with vegetables, but I'm going to talk about a pasture-based program here. Um, but there's other applications that I think you could get your head around when you look at some of the techniques I'm going to talk about and apply them to your particular case. But in terms of perennial pastures, it allows us to rest them, to improve their productivity. And what's interesting is if you plant these annuals at the right time of the year, um, you can actually out yield their the yield of perennial plants over that season. So you can actually get more forage and better quality. Okay. Um, so as a case study, I'm going to talk about just a simple system where we're trying to renovate a perennial pasture system. And generally what we'll target for these um, renovations would be pastures that really are just poor yield, or maybe we don't like the species composition. Um, we have a lot of tall fescue growing in parts of Michigan that is not particularly palatable. And um, so a lot of pe people with those kind of pastures would prefer maybe to put in a more palatable species. And um, also, if you have a pasture birth program on your farm, we have farmers in our area, part of the country that do birth on pasture. Um, those typically will have a higher contamination of fecal egg of fecal eggs because of the large rise in parasite um, out or egg output during that period around birth. So those are kind of dirty pastures, if you will, in terms of parasite infection. So those might be good targets as well. Anyhow, so year one, what typically what we would do is we would choose either a brassica-based mix or maybe our warm season crop like sorghum sudangrass, or maybe a mix of the two, which I'll describe. And common application is to put into a herbicide killed sod, sort of mid late June. So after, and, and if you think about like your crop, your cool season grass production in Iowa, I think you'd agree that most of it's over by the middle end of June. So if we target that mid to end of June period, we still get to graze it kill it or till it and um, plant this annual crop. Okay, I won't elaborate on this as much, but then we'll follow this annual crop with a, what I call short-term perennial crop. So a biannual short-term perennial, I use some really high quality uh, Forbes, Italian ryegrass, red clover in a, in a mixture that has a really high digestibility. And we'll keep that around for a couple of years, maybe two to three years and then we'll follow with a perennial pasture. So here's just an example of a farm. I happen to know this farm because it's my own. And what I'm showing here is I've taken my compost off this compost pad here. I've applied it to this area in early, mid-June. This, this is the pasture area that my sheep had given birth on. I moved them off of it, put the compost on in year one, and then I direct drill through the killed sod um, an annual crop, which I'll show you in a minute. Then year two and three, these are some of the pastures that I renovated. And over a period of five or six years, I've pretty much gone over my whole farm in a renovation scheme and improved the soil fertility, optimized the plant, the species that are there, and, and provided some nice, uh, more diverse forage base. Um, okay, so our goal with this first year we're kind of doing a double crop if you think about it. We're just having that perennial pasture produce into June, and then we're replacing it with an annual crop. So the goal is to provide high quality, parasite-free forage that's gonna fit that summer slump period. So we'll be able to graze this annual even a few times. When you can plant a crop in June, whether it be what you wanna call a cover crop or an annual forage in a system like this, you can do repeat grazings pretty nicely. Planting them in late July, August, 
generally you're looking at a strategy where you're going to probably want to more stockpile that forage and graze into the winter. So those are two different applications and it has to do with the number of degree growing days you, you have in front of you in, in the application. Okay, so we'll add some soil amendments. And again, these are the crop species that we want we might choose. I prefer if I can if if it fits your farming program and no-till seeding, it's gonna limit your soil moisture loss because it's getting to be June and it's gonna definitely minimize weeds. Here's just a couple pictures to show you. Um, I have a small farm, so I'm just renting a no-till drill. Um, you can see this killed sod with a bunch of compost applied to it and the application of a mixture of annual forages here in June. Um, I'm just giving you some examples of some of the species we use, both in this system and as cover crops. Here's a bunch of radish varieties. Um, what's interesting about these varieties in this picture, as you can see, there's a huge variation in the ratio of the top to the bulb. So there are improved varieties of forage radishes that you can see here. Um, on the left side that really have a whole lot of forage production. These are more your classic tillage radishes, kind of shown as a comparison, okay? And um, we see yields of, you know, up to three and a half tons per acre of just the top part of the plant. And this top part of the plant is utilized really um, efficiently by the animals because there's not a whole lot of stock in it. Um, here's just a picture of one of these forage radish varieties. Uh, these are available in the United States. This one's called Graza. Um, it's a New Zealand seed company has released it. But um, yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good, uh, you can do multiple grazings with this forage as well if you don't, if you're careful how you graze it. Um, here's some forage rape kale hybrids that um, some of these varieties are available in the United States. Some of them will be soon, or we've got ones that are very similar that are available in the United States. So these get pretty massive forage yields. They grow these in New Zealand quite a bit as a stockpiled forage for winter feed, but they have good application in our climate. Um, and if you give them enough sunlight and they get enough sunny days, they'll grow really well. But interestingly, they grow under limited soil moisture conditions, so they germinate well in June. Um, and they can put a whole heap of feed up. We can get up to five tons in 100 days. Um, the only caveat on that is, though, a lot of the uh, biomass, the plant mass of these plants is, is somewhat, I call this indigestible stock material. So it looks kind of exciting when you see this giant plants in your, pat, in your, uh, in, in your grazing system, but generally only about 45, 50% of it's um, able, to, able really to be utilized as high quality forage. Here's just a picture of a, um, combination where I've taken a no-till drill and I've um, put different types of seeds in the drill. I've got a mixture here of a, um, a high quality brown midribs um, Sudan hybrid that's kind of a dwarf right. It doesn't get very tall, it's very leafy. Alternating with strips of uh, brassica species, it's kind of a mixture between Chinese cabbage and turnips. So it's super succulent and grows really well in warm weather. And you can do get multiple grazings really nicely. This is only 25 days after planting. And this is really pretty much ready to graze. Um, so this is, this is kind of an ideal crop right here. They don't always come popping out of the ground quite like that. But they can, with proper management, 30 days can be a reasonable time to start grazing them. Here, they're being grazed after about 45 or 50 days. They're actually getting probably slightly mature. But you can see another one of these um, mixture um, strips, actually. I guess that's what I call it. These are strips. And what's nice about the strip system is that the plants don't necessarily compete um, so much, but you get this complementary in terms of their growth. Because the problem when you just mix brassicas and sorghum sudan is the sorghum sudan tends to shade out the brassica a bit. But with the strips, that doesn't happen. And you still have the advantage of some of the complementary nutrition with the, um, you know, lots of sugar and real more digestible carbohydrate of the uh, brassica combined with the nice highly digestible fiber of the um, sorghum sedan. So that makes a pretty good mixture. And you can get multiple grazings of this. 
we've done a number of land performance um, evaluations on these whole host of different crops. Here's some lambs we studied at MSU. They're grazing a monoculture. We've compared grazing a monoculture of brassica to the strips, to mixtures, to monocultures of Sudan. So we've done a fair number of different types of grazing programs to see what really works and what the pros and cons. Here's an example of a you know, pure seeding of the Sudan. We've also done sorghum. And um, so there's lots of different options you could consider here. So in year two and three, um, we'll put in a short-term perennial pasture. So the goal for this is a little different. We want outstanding quality and yield. Um, and um, we, again, we, you can add some more amendments to the uh, soil. I like to use uh, high legume content, like a lot of red clover. Forbs um, include chicory, plantain, and some ryegrass is sometimes a nice complement too. Um, we'll graze this for two years. I write that down as two years. I've actually done three years a few times, and that's worked out pretty well. Um, here's just a picture of that really nice forage. And here is a, um, like a young ewe that just gave birth on pasture. This is like a yearling ewe. Sheep like this that are raising twins, you can see, are going to need some pretty high-quality forage to meet their requirements. And we actually see, we've looked at performance of these kind of sheep on this kind of pasture system. And they actually don't even lose weight during lactation. They maintain their body weight. And um, that's a real plus. Um, just a picture of our portable handling system that we use to weigh sheep on pasture at MSU. And we've done a bunch of studies where we've looked at 30-day periods of lamb growth, doing two to four-day grazing bouts. We've done forage measures on these pastures, looked at crop yield, and did some um, fairly basic production costs that we've calculated. Here's just some of those results. Here's comparing. Um, a mix of turnip in Sudan to a pure seeding of the turnip to a strip mixture. That nice picture I showed you is that treatment right here. And here's just pure Sudan. And you can see that um, these were planted in June. They're grazed for over 100 days into, um, from June into um, early fall. Um, I think we got th about three or four grazing bouts off these. So with that, you get a pretty high dry matter yield. Um, we tend to target to leave a fair bit of forage behind. We don't overgraze these. And what's really strike, struck me and surprised me actually is the gain that we got on an individual animal basis. I mean, these are really nice rates of gain. You probably, I, I didn't realize this was possible until we did these studies. Um, so we're getting gains approaching not quite what you see with grain, of course, but a, a very high rate of gain. We calculate that on an acre basis. We get pretty ni we get nice gains per acre, and our costs our costs are going to be a little higher than permanent pasture, but they're still certainly probably half the cost of a grain-based system. I compared that to this short-term perennial system here, okay, and in this case, we also get very nice gains, very similar. But because we're grazing it a longer time of the year, we've got greater gain per acre over that year. So this is on a yearly basis here. And we do also have cheaper gain because this crop is uh, the cost of um, establishment are spread over like a two to three year period. And there is more gain per acre. So it's a pretty inexpensive system. If we compare that to perennial um, system, oops, um, which is kind of our control, if you will, this orchard grass tall fescue, that has a pretty high forage yield, but the gains are much lower. The gains per acre are pretty nice just because we have this high yield, but the performance of animals is certainly less on a, and um, so, and, but, but it is relatively inexpensive forage. But you can see how this diversification allows you to meet the needs of lambs and lactating ewes better than you would have with a perennial system. I think this um, kind of gain per acre uh, evaluation is really helpful to evaluate these forages. So if we look at this kind of gain per acre over a year, we can see that if we compare our rotation system to that of just a perennial pasture maintained over three years, we definitely get an increase in forage production 
Um, and that, and because we're looking at gains per acre here, it's also a measure of quality because that's forage um, quality directly translating into animal performance. So it is, it is a pretty nice gain that you see in a system like that. Okay. Um, the question I have by Lee uh, Tisdale, he asked, um, does parasite free mean that the grass or forage haven't been grazed before? That's essentially right. It's because they've been rested. When you desiccate a pasture, for example, with Roundup and rest it for like 45 days, that combination makes it essentially parasite free um, or very, very low infectivity. Okay. So we get some pretty big gains in productivity here. So now I'm just gonna kind of change gears a bit, um, continue to talk about annuals, but in a different application. In this case, I'm gonna talk about annuals as applied to cover crops um, for small ruminants. And this can really help a system, a farming program. It can be used within a cropping system, has big potential after primary crops of small grains, vegetables, and corn harvested for silage in particular. particular. Um, Fencing and water, many would consider barriers, but I would say that they're pretty easily overcome, and I'll discuss that. Um, and certainly, we have opportunities for a nice complement between crop and livestock programs within your own program, if you have a cropping program, or perhaps in partnership with a neighbor who raises crops, if you're a sheep farmer, that is. Um, so crop farmers, obviously, as you well know, and uh, use cover crops for a variety of reasons, uh, quite a few good reasons, including nutrient scavenging, soil protection, pest and weed control. And so they can also, of course, these cover crops are really high quality forage. And a nice thing about them as well is some of the species that we can use for, that we typically like to use for cover crops also stockpile and can hold their value into the winter pretty nicely. So that can fill a deficit and extend some grazing and give you some really high quality forage when you would um, otherwise have to store more likely more expensive stored feed. Some of the management guidelines I can describe and give you an overview here are, you know, there's a lot of opportunities with different cropping programs. Um, uh, silage corn, um, corn grain, sweet corn, um, but I'm going to talk mostly about winter wheat um, just because that's what I've had the most experience. And that's a pretty much a no brainer. If you're planning, if you're growing winter wheat and we grow a reasonable amount here in Michigan, you essentially have a fallow field from sometime in July. And that's a lot of growing opportunity that you're squandering if you don't grow a cover crop. And so that's mostly what I've done is take advantage of winter um, wheat um, cropping programs in terms of cover crop grazing. The choices, um, generally I've selected them from the brassica, radish, radishes, and some cereal, and, and a combination with cereal grains. I'll describe why in a second. Um, I think the cereal grains, they both give a complement in terms of nutrition for the animal. They also, um, I think, help protect the soil a little better. Um, like right now, we're grazing sheep on cover crops, and it's a very wet fall. We've had a lot of rain, freeze conditions, a lot of mud, essentially. And these cereal grains, they prevent some of the, um, I don't know, plugging of soil type problems you might see um, because they, they, they just keep the mud problem from being as severe, for lack of a better term. Um, so these mixtures are going to offer complementary nutrition control erosion better and um, potentially because they have different types of roots and maybe scavenge nutrients differently can help complementary effects in terms of retaining nutrients in the soil profile. Um, okay, I see there's a few questions. Maybe I'll try to answer some of them. Um, does the flavor of meat change on turnip Sudan cover crop? Um, that's a great question. Um, there is some consideration in the literature about that, not real strong evidence. Certainly milk will be heavily flavored, whether meat is or isn't. It's actually a question that I just wrote a grant for and want to answer. Um, I would say 
to play it safe. I think if you remove animals from these cover crops for a fairly short period of time, even a week, 10 days, you may find that that would totally minimize that effect, but that's exactly a question I wanna answer with a, some controlled study. Um, another question is, how do you avoid bloating or foundering on cover crops? Um, I think I'll answer that as I move along. Um, most of these cover crops, especially if you have a small grain, like a, a forage oat, you're, you're not gonna have a bloat problem. Um, and I don't really see many foundering problems either. So um, I know I've been, con people are concerned about those things, but we really don't see those problems, um, especially even on the, actually on the monocultures, we haven't seen as much of a problem as I might expect either. So luckily that hasn't been um, uh, su su such a concern. Okay. And the other question was after, uh, is prussic acid, um, is that a concern with sorghum Sudan crosses? Yeah, it can be a concern, but like um, generally the prussic acid levels are lower than we anticipate. And I've accidentally grazed those crops. I wouldn't recommend that you do it, um, especially the ones with a greater sorghum content. The Sudan grass, as I understand, will have lower prussic acid. And I really haven't run into a problem with that. And typically, we're not grazing those too far into the fall. So I, I'd say as a recommendation, if you plan on grazing stuff late into the fall, don't use those crops. But on the other hand, their margin of safety is, I think, better than what's been advertised to. Okay, so I'm going to just move on for a little bit. And, um, and then... Uh, try to answer questions, a few more questions as I get an opportunity here. Um, so the kind of cover crop grazing program that we've been looking at is pretty basic. We've used brassica, radish combinations, basically with forage with oats. Um, I call them forage oats. It's not really necessarily a plant selected for forage sometimes, but we like the later maturing oats certainly help. So I like to call them more late maturing oats because they do var vary in their maturity. Um, these are planted in the wheat stubble whenever we can get that to happen. Sometimes it's been as late as later August. Um, I've found um, when we've evaluated fertilization that it's cost effective to do add some nitrogen to it. If that fits your production um, criteria, um, it's definitely, these are pretty nutrient um, you know, loving plants. So um, they definitely respond to nitrogen application. And if you think about it, if you do do this on your neighbor's crop field, they kind of get a nitrogen credit essentially with that. So they might be happy that you're doing that. Um, and you will get a return on your investment that's really positive. Uh, generally, we introduce the sheep in October pretty much have removed them in early January, although sometimes we've tried to overwinter them on these crops as variable success. Um, depends on the year quite a bit. And, um, but certainly into early January in our particular climate, we've been able to do really well with that, this kind of system. So as far as the partnership goes between the sheep and crop farmer, the sheep farm is pretty much paid for the seed and fertilizer, does all the grazing management, and the crop farm simply plants the seed. So they're basically getting a cover crop for free, um, and, um, but they still have to plant it. Um, the combinations, again, we've used these mixtures to provide this complementary nutrition. Um, I would say this combination does a few things. It might lower some of that risk that was of a concern about bloat, possible foundering, which I haven't, really haven't seen even in pure brass, straight brassica plantings. But... Um, that would certainly reduce that risk. And again, the mud issue I talked about already. Um, bulb turnips, I've, I just, they're kind of a standard that I really can't get away from. <laughs> Some of the improved varieties um, are better than your common purple top turnip, but even your common purple top turnip is a pretty nice bulb species that does well. Um, <coughs> excuse me, the disadvantage of bulb turnips is their tops will shrivel up pretty good when you get cold weather. So, but the bulbs certainly stockpile well until you have a lot of extensive freeze thaw conditions. So I include them in the mix um, 
and um, but I also like to add other things. Um, I've added some ra some of these rape and kill hybrids. Uh, they do pretty well. Uh, they tend to hold their quality until it's colder. They have more um, sort of natural antifreeze in in their um, in the plant. Um, radishes are an interesting choice too. Um, they work pretty well. Um, I'd say they're kind of intermediate. The tops will hold their quality pretty long, but not as long as the rape. And the radishes, especially the tillage radishes, are a pretty nice cover crop um, kind of compromise. The sheep aren't going to be able to eat only the tops of those radishes, but they do kind of provide some of that um, cover crop benefit by having those kind of rot in the ground and maybe increase some soil tilth and percolation. Um, here's just um, some of these species showing here, 40 days post-emergence. Um, we have purple top turnip, um, tillage radish, and a couple of these uh, uh, rape kale hybrids. Here's a picture of sheep grazing um, in early December, I believe. And if I walked out into the farm where my sheep are grazing, it looked just about like this today as well. Um, so this has been a very reliable crop um, and um, fair, fair bit of biomass out there and the sheep do really well grazing it. You can see we use um, this kind of electronet netting, which is a really effective um, fencing barrier, uh, pretty foolproof, keeps canines out, keeps the sheep in. And because you're on rented land, so to speak, or someone else's land at least, um, you really want to keep your relations um, positive. So having a um, secure fence like that is, is really important. Um, I'll see if I can answer a question here. Um, do you use shade when moving them through a cover crop field? Um, nope. Um, we don't need shade, um, and it's this time of year. Um, Stocking rate for lambs in use per acre. Um, that's a little hard for me to give you a quick sense for. Um, we can put a lot of sheep on these crops. Um, they're, you know, it's not like a typical pasture. Um, I'm just thinking out loud. Um, right now I've got about 120 ewes on... Um, a 30 acre field that's going to last about three and a half months. So that can kind of give you a sense of the kind of stocking rate over time that we have with some of these crops. You can kind of take a look at the yields and kind of do some estimates of what you think your intakes are going to be and the size of sheep you have and get a sense for stocking rate um, if you'd like. Um, here's a picture of the uh, um, one of the forage um, rape varieties that I grew in my own farm. And you can see it looks pretty impressive. Um, this particular crop, I grazed well into January. It, it really held up well in the snow even. Um, but uh, again, you th it looks like there's just heaps and heaps of feed there. There is, but it's a little less than you think because a lot of it is stock. But on the other hand, that does um, add some biomass and, 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 and some... Um, nutrients back into the soil, so it's all pretty much a good thing. Um, here's a picture of these uh, forage radishes. This doesn't look like quite as much feed perhaps, but it's thick and much of the, um, the tops are almost entirely uh, available for grazing. There's very little the animals would necessarily leave behind as indigestible. It's just the stuff they trample. Here's again one of those forage rape varieties and another one as well. Um, here's a picture of the um, um, one of the forage rape hybrids in late January. You can see it's, it's kind of losing its quality a little bit. Here's um, one of the Chinese cabbage hybrids on the other hand which isn't nearly as good in the snow so that's less, less ideal for the um, winter grazing perhaps. Um, just a picture of a cover crop 
in January. Um, some people might be a little concerned because these are forage oats and it doesn't look like the quality is necessarily there because it's kind of desiccating. But if you dig through the snow, it's just full of nice green turnip tops and radish tops. And again, they'll eat those forage oats even if they're somewhat desiccated. And these animals definitely gain weight as, as an indicator of forage quality. And here's just a picture of how we apply this on my particular home farm. We'll graze those sheep, we'll walk them home, and you can see these ewes are gonna give birth in about two, three weeks, and they're in excellent body condition. They have nice clean fleeces, not that wool is our primary product with these kinds of sheep, but we typically would just spring right into the barn, shear them, and we'll lamb them in winter and um, have saved a whole lot of money on stored forage costs and provided a very high quality plain and nutrition. Um, and you can tell these ewes are carrying quite a few lambs. This is over 200% lamb crop these ewes are gonna be having. So met pretty much on high quality forage. Some of the management guidelines to consider. Um, okay, uh, when do you start grazing a cover crop? Um, I guess I think about it really as a balance between the desire of a sheep farmer to get maximum use of the cover crop opportunity um, versus allowing enough time for the cover crops to do their work for the crop farmer. So when would that be? I would say, I don't know, I like to think that um, as the plants sort of reach um, a point where their growth rate slows, which is going to be in my climate like early November, probably similar in Iowa. It's probably a time you definitely want to be grazing them. Um, you can graze them earlier if you want. You just might want to leave a little more of the cover crop behind and graze them more lightly, leave a smaller residual. Um, and you could, you could get on in on them early. That way they still get a chance to grow and sequester nutrients and protect the soil. Maybe just graze them more lightly. Um, on the other hand, um, excuse me, that's when you'd leave a large residual. Um, or to be early and late season cover crop grazing. You leave a smaller residual, maybe when you're, um, when you, when you're just trying to maximize obviously the use of the crop and when there isn't a lot of opportunity for compaction of soil or really muddy conditions, you could take a little bit more. Um, I generally probably leave more of the larger residual um, behind because um, I generally am not limited in the amount of cover crop we have available for these sheep. So we tend to graze them a little more lightly. And that and I think that's a better scenario for the crop farmer as well, where we do harvest maybe um, uh, maybe 40% and leave 60% behind. And that leaves a nice cover on the soil as well. Um, I'll show you a picture here. It's just a picture I took this morning actually of it's been really muddy this fall. It actually froze. And here's um, the residual I've left behind in a cover crop field I'm grazing right now. You can see there's a fair bit of biomass and that's nicely kind of pressed into the soil or on the soil surface, protecting it pretty nicely. Um, and uh, I think that's a pretty good, pretty nice end point right there. Um, as far as the nutrient composition goes of these mixes, um, here's just an example of some analysis I did several years ago. Um, this is actually a little higher energy and a little pr lower protein than we've seen other years, but you can see that it's basically a high energy crop. And you know, you'd be challenged to find an energy level as high as that with most um, of the forages, stored forages you'd buy. And that's mostly explained by the high soluble carbohydrate level of these turnips. Um, the no seed control here is actually winter wheat, which is an awesome forage also. So that has also very high energy. Um, and the um, dry matter digestibilities of these are excellent. So they're really high quality forages, I guess is my take home for this slide. Um, and if you consider the cost of um, these crops or what their value is, if you take the cost of the seed, um, fertilizer, um, and then what's 
able to be utilized. Um, even on a poor year when we've got low crop yields, that forage cost is going to be typically less than $70. Most typically when we have higher forage yields, like when we're getting sort of able to graze a good two, two to 3,000 pounds of forage per acre, which is possible like this year definitely is happening, we're going to get down in that $30 to $40 per dry matter ton of forage. So that's some pretty cheap high quality forage um, if you uh, can compare that to other opportunities. Uh, okay, so here's some forage quality um, figures um, for the tops, which are of, of a, of a um, leafy, uh, it's actually a bulb turnip, an improved bulb turnip, and this is Samson. It's uh, really nice bulbs and a lot of leaf as well. Um, you can see these are, the tops are fairly high in protein. Um, and high in energy. That's why lambs grow really well on them. The bulbs are also pretty decent, but they have a high water content. They're very watery. And in fact, a lot of times they're, yeah, a good 95, even 96% water. They're also, but they're very high in energy, a little lower in protein. Um, so where do these cover crops fit in terms of sheep production systems? Um, I'd say they fit many levels. Uh, one would be uh, you can actually get some good backgrounding of lambs on these. I don't know if you would call it lamb finishing diet. Depends how you consider that, but pretty close. Um, these are the types of crops that most of the New Zealand sheep production system, they finish their lambs on, for example. So they're getting gains of you know probably 0 0.5 0 0.6 pounds per day we've gotten gains up to almost 0 0.7 on these high quality brassica pastures but i would i would expect them more a low a little lower rate of gain but that definitely is going to um give you a nice backgrounding level of nutrition you're getting over half a pound to gain you could call it close to a finishing level of nutrition where they're going to lay on a little more fat so it's possible, and actually something we want to evaluate is how far we can go with um, lamb backgrounding versus finishing and these kind of crops. And that's something we're going to explore more in the next few years, I think. Um, as far as the ewe flock goes, the maternal side of it, um, it's definitely a perfect forage for flushing ewes. So I use those to, flushing of course, is to increase the energy content of the diet just before breeding. You can get a pretty dramatic impact on your lamb crop. You can increase the number of lambs by close to 25% by improving that amount of energy. And um, so it's great for that. It's also actually pretty good even into late pregnancy. However, most of the time we like to move the animals off a few weeks before lambing at the very least um, just because they're, um, you know you're going to need to bring them inside for lambing. And uh, it's nice to get them transitioned on to a different feeding program. But I'd say up until two, three weeks before lambing is excellent nutrition. We get our sheep easily gaining a full body condition score, a good 10 to 15 pounds of tissue reserves. And so, you know, well, I have an accelerated lamb production system. So I noticed that my yearling ewes that lambed in May, that we um, wean the lambs then in August. We get them bred in September. We flush them on these crops, get them bred. By the time they come in for their next lambing um, season in, uh, in early winter, in, in February or midwinter, I guess, um, they've gained quite a bit of weight and they no longer look like yearling ewes that just gave birth to twins. They look, they look really nice. So they definitely get some good compensatory gain. Uh, and replacement ewe lambs, it's also excellent for them. They need a little higher plane of nutrition to get, so they're growing. So it's a really good diet for those kind of animals. Um, so Lee asked me, can you keep the coyotes out with that fence? Or you need a taller fence. Um, I would say that um, we've had good success keeping canines out, dogs and coyotes. Um, and I haven't had to use a taller fence. 
um, that is my experience with using it. And I've done it in two different states over about a 20 year period where there's a significant coyote population. Um, we have good energizers, they're well energized fences. I don't know if everyone could say the same, but um, I felt pretty confident using Electronet um, and um, not having any a single loss to coyotes over quite a long period of time. Um, but again, these are well-energized fences, so I think that's really important. Uh, what is your opinion on flash grazing a cash wheat crop in the spring? Um, that's a great question. I haven't really done that, but I've heard people who've done that and thought it worked really well. I think it's possible to do that. I have a hard time. I, I don't like to go beyond my experience too much on this, so I haven't actually done that, but I think it's an interesting idea and I think it has good potential if you're like, as you say, flash grazing it. Um, so can we let sheep be the cover crop terminators and, and then fertilize the soil, I guess? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, that's that's kind of what the whole idea would be. Um, sun hemp falling a wheat crop. Are you too far north? Yeah, I haven't tried sun hemp. Um, I know some people further east in a more temperate zone have, so I'm sorry, I can't really speak to that. Again, I kind of want to speak from my base of knowledge and have more confidence, but I've heard it's a good, a, has good potential. Uh, could you cover your agreement with landowners? Sure. Um, it's very simple. It's as simple as anything. I just pay for the seed and, um, and manage the sheep and the farmer uh, plants the cover crop. And they were planning on planting this cover crop anyhow. So I guess you could say I'm kind of enhancing, recycling, terminating the cover crop for them um, and uh, taking maybe 30, 40% of the biomass for my sheep, but taking very few nutrients off the farm really, because the only nutrients coming off the farm is that tissue gain of my sheep which in the big scheme of things is fairly minimal. Okay. All right. So I'll keep moving. Um, the, uh, here's just some pictures of some lambs that we've backgrounded or even come close to finishing. I remember these were lambs at MSU and he tells it's been an ice storm here and we just took them off this cover crop here in January, put them on grain and, you know, they were really only needed about, two, three weeks of, of grain diet to give them adequate finish to have really nice quality lambs. Um, one, uh, uh, I guess, um, warning um, would be that these brassica species like turnips and rape tend to be what's called goiterogenic. So they have um, compounds in their plant chemistry that interfere with iodine uptake um, by animals, so they'll tend to get a goiter or an enlarged thyroid gland if um, you don't give them adequate iodine. So it's not like they inhibit iodine uptake fully, they, but they do inhibit it, so you have to overwhelm the system a little bit, their uptake limitation by giving them supplemental iodine. So what we found, for example, I've worked with some of the mineral companies in Michigan, increase the iodine which is safe and it's a pretty safe thing to increase um, increase iodine to about 300 parts per million in a basically a salt mixture it's mostly salt and we seem to have really no problems with goiter but if you don't occasionally will have problems with um, iodine deficiency okay so in summary you get cheap forage high quality um, you can meet the needs of light pregnancy, even finishing, there's really a low risk of crop yield. Even if you have a bad year, like I think last year we had a pretty droughty August and we didn't get great germination and um, September as well uh, was just really dry. So the, our cover crops really didn't grow much until about the end of September and then they only grew for like three or four weeks. But even with that, we still had quality um, it might have cost us a little bit more in terms of the, you know, the value of what we got out of it wasn't, you know, the massive forage we got was a little less to cover our 
seed and fertilizer costs, but still it was cheap feed and, um, and worth doing. So it's been kind of a no brainer to do this. Uh, definitely fills a hole in a perennial based grazing system or pretty much anyone's farming program who wouldn't want to feed, um, reduce the amount of stored feed with high quality forage like this, right? Um, whether you're a grazing system or not. Um, it'll benefit crop production, the use of cover crops certainly, and um, grazing them. Does grazing improve cover crop benefit? I'm not sure if it does or doesn't. I don't think it hurts it though. And you know, maybe there's some benefit in terms of enhanced residue recycling. Um, certainly, I don't think it detracts much as long as you don't overgraze a cover crop. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the potential limits here for um, grazing cover crops, and I'll try to wrap this up. Um, we have um, basically fencing and water would be, in summary, what we're kind of concerned about or people would be concerned about. Um, you need secure fencing. You needs to be portable, if you're, especially if you're on <coughs> cropping land. And water, yeah, how can it be supplied on, on this kind of crop land? I'll get to that in a second. So here's just examples of using this electro net. You have a particular um, supplier of this product that happens to be in your state that really probably should be paying me for giving these webinars because it's an excellent product. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but it is an excellent product. I prefer the version of electro net that has these um, uh, you know, solid plastic struts, if you will. Um, there, it's much stiffer and and really stays up nicely in the um, in um, you know weather, in various weather conditions. Um, I might be exaggerating things here a little bit, but it looks pretty good here with this ice on it. It'll fall over at some point, but it certainly stays up better than other um, types of of, of electronet. And um, what I find when this happens is there's pretty good feed in that field. The sheep are grazing through the snow pretty effectively. And about the time you're getting concerned about the sheep leaving the field, um, a thaw happens and you can put your fences right back up again. Um, of course, there are issues um, about sticking this in frozen ground. What I found in the two climates I've raised sheep in, which is central New York and Michigan, very similar climates, I can put up electro net pretty much until early January. Um, once I get past early January, it's harder. And so I will, if I'm going to graze into November or into, say, February, I'll want to put up pretty much all of my electro net ahead of time because it is hard to move once it freezes. But you'd be surprised how how um, easy it still is to put into the ground, I guess, even into early winter. The ground actually, even with it's frozen, like even half an inch, the um, it's still easy to put it in. So it's a pretty cheap system. Um, when we do these simple calculations, you can fence a lot of ground in a short in a quick hurry if you're experienced at it. And my kids are pretty experienced at doing this. Um, and uh, doing some calculations on the number of uh, the labor it costs and your labor costs and the time, I estimate a max of like $5 per ton of forage dry matter consumed. And that takes into account the labor and um, cost of the fencing over a 10 year life, which is pretty much how long it lasts. And uh, so that's actually, you know, a pretty cheap feeding system. Um, energizers, yeah, you definitely want to use uh, a, you need a portal energizer if you're away from electricity, obviously. And I've used units up to six or eight joules that are portable. They can be, um, there's a limit though to how much electronet you can run off a portable system just because the output is limited. I can, I can probably graze, jeez, uh, about five acres with a six joule unit, which is pretty good pasture. Um, and the charge on a typical deep cycle battery is maintained for about a week on a six joule unit. 
And so it isn't really a big deal. You just got to flip batteries out about every week, which is not really a big concern. Um, so that, that works very well. Um, and yeah, obviously you got to move ground rods, but you can just use a portable ground rod system like this. Um, yeah, there's times where you've got pretty big um, crop volumes um, that would need to be a bit of a concern and you set up your cover crops. Um, so we simply just make wheel tracks where we want to put up the net and that just we drive our truck or a vehicle over that line and that's enough to put the netting up really easily and that's, so that's pretty simple. Um, So one of the last things I want to talk about is water, but I'll take just a short break for some questions here. I see um, Kylie is asking me, um, can I graze several hundred sheep and provide daily management? Is there any resource link producer to producer? I can graze several hundred sheep and provide daily management. Um, I'm not sure if I understand your question, sorry. Are you asking me, are there you know, maybe some networks that can be made with other producers doing the system? Um, I'm not sure if there are some formal networks. Um, can you discuss your mineral program? Um, uh, that would take me some time. Mineral program is pretty simple. I simply use um, trace mineralized salt with a little bit of enhanced iodine content um, I worry mostly about selenium and iodine, making sure the selenium's up to its maximum allowable amount, legal allowable amount, and having iodine in that 300 ppm range. Um, there's other, like cobalt, there's other um, minerals that also you need to have in your mix. Um, but yeah, I, I think if you'd like to contact me for some additional details on that, I'd be glad to do that. Um, <laughs> all right, yeah. Um, Luke said jealous or envious, I guess, of my Prattly. And a Prattly is just the name of the portable handling system. And those are really sweet. Yeah, they, they're an imported system, but they're great. You can handle sheep pretty much anywhere very efficiently. And they're really nice to have. Uh, so factors to consider as far as water needs go. Um, so consider that these crops are very lush, okay? Um, a brassica-based mixture is going to be at least 80% water, uh, maybe more. And, but that's going to desiccate as the crop dies and freeze thaws a bit. So it could go down a little bit. Most of the time they're going to be in that 70, 80% range. Even actually, ironically, the, um, one of the issues is sometimes the brassicas have too much water, which is kind of funny. Um, so they have a lot of forage water content. Also recognize that the needs of your animals are gonna go down a lot as it cools. So as it cools down into the you know, 30, 40 degree range, you're, the animals only need about half the amount of water, which is kind of convenient because that's when we kind of want to be grazing these crops. Um, and you know, recognize that the water needs are gonna be dependent on the stage of production. So you're not gonna have lactating use on these crops typically. Um, they would probably need some supplemental water as late pregnant use may as well, but most other stages of productions and cool weather aren't going to need supplemental water and they can get the water needs pretty much from the water content of the crop. And also we tend to have a good snowfall, which is another supplement of water um, out in the pasture. So here's something I put together um, looking at the relationship between air temperature and the forage water content you'd need to see in forage to meet the needs of animals before they're late pregnant. So all classes of sheep that are not late pregnant or lactating, this would apply to. And so what is this telling you? Well, at a temperature of about say 40 degrees, late fall conditions, we're gonna need forage water content of about, oh, um, 68% and there's very few times that your um, uh, cover crops not, not going to provide that amount of water. So pretty much the forage water content, the content of water in forage is going to meet the needs of animals during cool weather just fine. And if you were to put 
nice fresh water in front of your animals grazing one of these crops, unless they're just habitually used to drinking out of a bucket and that's like a kind of a, I don't know, like a reflex for them, they'll ignore the water. And you can make yourself feel better um, by using that. And, you, you know, you do want to make sure that you get their water so that they continue to gain weight. But it's almost never a concern during cover crop grazing conditions as long as they're not in late pregnancy. So here's comparison of sheep and cattle and the for minimum forage water content needed. So as long as your forage water content's over 66%, which it almost always is in cover crop grazing, you're not going to have to bring water out there, okay? Um, here's just um, a close-up of that cover crop um, that looked kind of brown. I showed you a picture of I remember that day I took that picture. It was the last day before I moved the sheep off of it, and I dug into the snow. Here's that nice green tops of these um, tillage radishes um, that are present, and um, this had, like, quite a bit of water content in it, even with these kind of desiccated oats. Um, here is a picture. Um, I didn't actually take this picture. My predecessor, Joe Rook, did. And this is a turnip field. You can see just heaps of turnips out there. And um, that probably has too much water for sheep, you know. And generally, that's not much of a problem. I usually don't plant like a sole crop of turnips like that. But... <laughs> Interesting thing is here, these animals, some people will drive by and be concerned about their water. They actually probably have too much. Um, so yeah, so the only time you have problems is during late pregnancy and soft snow will make up a deficit. Um, and you might need to move off, you use off during late pregnancy, but generally you don't have late pregnant use on in, in these grazing programs, so it's not much of a concern. Um, Okay, so in summary then, and this is probably my last slide pretty much. Um, <clears throat> so this forage water content is going to meet the needs of most classes of sheep during the period that you normally graze cover crops. Um, the consumption of soft snow is going to contribute to water needs. Uh, some exceptions to the rule might be brassica tuber grazing during late pregnancy where you actually you're going to limit dry matter intake because there's too much water um, maybe prolific use during late pregnancy which probably should be off grazing by that late pregnancy stage and then if you have occasional dry spells during mild weather um, but those are not actually too common in in fall where they're to the extent that they need to, you need to suddenly bring water to the animals. Um, frozen snow and ice, though, I'd say would be, can limit grazing access at times. That's something we get concerned about. And occasionally, when we've been grazing cover crops well into January, February, and we've had a really heavy snowfall, or maybe um, a freeze thaw type condition where we got, kind of get an ice layer on the ground and it's kind of keeping the animals from accessing the cover crops as well. I have done some supplemental feeding on, on, on cover crop ground. Maybe I have to feed for three or four days. Typically, in my experience at least, that's usually enough before you get a break in the weather and there's another thaw cycle and suddenly the cover crop's available again. So if you do want to graze the cover crops well into the grazing season, you kind of need a game plan for prides and supplemental feed mostly due to snow conditions. Um, and you just monitor their body condition score. I mean, that's really what you need to do is monitor their intake and body condition score. So um, just want to thank the people who have helped me at MSU and otherwise in, in industry. Um, Dr. Kim Cassidy is our forage agronomist who's um, contributed, Santiago Utsumi, Aaron Rechtenwald, I've had some of the industry collaborators who've helped me um, partner on some of the seed supplies have included John Snyder from PGGs and Jerry Davis, Brian Haynes, and then all the MSU staff and grad students who've helped me quite a few and students as well. And uh, so with that, I uh, thank you for your attention and here's my contact information. 
um, pretty reliable to get a hold of me. Well, I don't know if it's reliable. You can try me <laughs> email. I'll try to answer your questions. Um, our semester is pretty hot and heavy right now. Or it's the last week of classes, but I can uh, definitely um, try to answer your questions on email too. So, um, awesome. Hey, thank you, Richard. Yeah, you're welcome. Yep. And that was, that was uh, loaded with some great detail, which is just what we like here at, at practical farmers of Iowa, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. So, Super useful. Um, so it, we do have a couple more minutes with Richard here before we before we cut him loose. So if you've got some more questions, put them in the chat box. Looks like there's a few more here um, that are waiting on you, Richard. First of all, was there any other comment on on Lee's original question about about bloating with with sheep on cover crops with any f different forage types to be concerned about or any issues to be aware of there? I think um, that. Having a mix of the forage oats is pretty much going to eliminate that concern. Um, I think any time though, I would, I, I'm a little cautious. If I go from, I don't know, your typical perennial pasture straight to like a really lush, like brassica, I would prefer to have more of a transition of a few days where maybe, you know, if I could give them some access to, you know, a ditch or something next to the field so they make a transition. But I find that it's just mostly a matter of transition. You can transition them to um, pretty much a straight brassica mixture after a few days without too much of a problem. So um, I see Wendy has asked me, um, are there any tips on moving sheep down the road? Yes. Um, what I would suggest is you, a couple things. Um, Make sure they got a full stomach, first of all. So when I want to move them down the road, I make sure, you know, they, I maybe put them on to the last field I want to graze like a day or two before. So they're still, they're totally full. So they're not running around too fast. Um, I, um, it's nice if there's snow cover um, on your neighbor's lawns so that they don't see that nice green grass and run onto them. But usually, you know, if we, if, if we just have one person in front, one person behind and one person on the side, we can move down the road pretty well. Um, my sheep are pretty well entrained to um, the sound of anything in a white pail. They just are conditioned to that because they're used to being fed a little bit of corn from time to time. If I simply take a couple of little stones and stick them and shake them in a white pail, my sheep would probably follow me, you know, over a cliff. I mean, so that's kind of a lure that we sometimes use. Um, next question is, do you suggest certain sheep breeds for grazing covers? I think all sheep will do great in cover crops. Um, you know, I wouldn't put any limit on, 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 on breeds. Um, you're welcome, Carl. Um, Rich is asking me, um, do you need to train sheep on the Electronet? Certainly, um, yeah. Anytime you use an electric fence product, you really need to have the animals trained. And uh, we use it in our rotational grazing system already, so there's no real training needed when we get to the cover crop. But yeah, you'd have to be confident and to train them, you just want to make sure you have the, the fence really well energized. And I would do that not on your neighbor's land. So um, can hair sheep be used in this system? I'll say yes. Um, we do have actually quite a few hair sheep producers who really like the cover crop grazing system in Michigan. And I don't think there's any concern with them having hair versus wool. Um, maybe if in northern Michigan or it's a little colder and more windswept areas, maybe you would wonder if there's a limit there, but not where we live at least. Um, so diverse cover crop mixes can serve the purpose of improving soil health. Yes. Yep. They, they can. We've kind of gone on the uh, point of increasing the diversity. I've made some, um, quite diverse mixes. I think there's a point where you're not going to see as much of a, you know, there's a point of like how many things do you need in the mix to get optimal 
cover crop function and performance, maybe there, there might be a limit to that. But yeah, I like some diversity in the mix for sure. Um, do you know of any natural remedies for treating parasites? Okay, I'm gonna interpret that as maybe plant compounds, not like chemical dewormers. Um, there are some plant compounds that will at least, what do you wanna say? They won't necessarily work as well as a chemical dewormer, but they'll definitely um, control parasite infection. Um, any plant with a high condensed tannin content tends to have better, um, tends to control parasites better. What kind of plants would that be? For example, bird's foot trefoil will help minimize parasite, I guess, infection symptoms. However, what I found when I graze animals in bird's foot trefoil about, and I've studied this actually, um, as soon as we take them off the bird's foot trefoil and stick them on a more common type of pasture, like say Timothy-based pasture, they come right back. So they don't actually kill the parasites necessarily, but they do suppress them and make them feel bad. <laughs> so um, yeah, but as far as like lots of other things that are purported to be um, great natural herbal remedies, by and large, most of those don't work very well, unfortunately. But there are some um, tannin-rich um, plants that do seem to work pretty well. Um, where do you source your seed? Um, well, um, that PGG Seed Company does is a New Zealand-based seed company. They are a pretty good source for some of these um, brassica species, but I've seen many other seed companies produce them as well. Um, I know Berenberg produces a few nice ones. There's quite a few companies, so I kind of can't really give you a comprehensive list, um, but you can find many seed companies that will um, carry those varieties from those primary companies at least. Um, as far as flushing on cover crops, uh, yeah, so um, I've actually, yeah, I've bred sheep on cover crops, definitely flush them on cover crops. Um, you know, I guess when I, flushing breeding programs are a little bit synonymous. I tend to keep them on a flushing diet during early breeding because I don't know when they're going to get bred, right? So, um, so yeah, I'll actually breed use on the cover crops and that's been real positive. I would say I've gotten excellent lambing rates on cover crops. Um, and never really considered needing to increase energy content in any other way except grazing them. So it's worked really well. Uh, uh, Randall asks me, um, would you use different cover crops in a situation following a row crops harvest in the fall like corn or soybeans? Yeah, you know, you have to consider um, the number of uh, degree growing days, I guess, for those crops. So you do need a minimum number, like for brassicas, boy, you know, I think you'd need, um, I mean, where we live, I wouldn't think, it, I've tried to plant them in mid-September and haven't had much success. Um, I can't really equate that to growing days exactly in my mind quickly. Um, so yeah, you probably want different choices. Um, you know, cereal rye is an opportunity to plant a little later in the year. You might not get much grazing that fall, but you might get some nice grazing early in the spring, which is a pretty nice, have a pretty nice benefit for a um, production system as well. So those are options to consider. Um, of course, there are methods that people have used to try to stick brassicas in standing corn and if I think I've had some success, um, challenges seeding systems, and you're, you guys probably know more about that than me, um, but I think it is possible to do that. It's just kind of a challenge. Um, any problems grazing cereal rye over the winter? Um, I guess it's just the amount of it. Uh, and then, um, do you have any herbicide grazing fact sheet for the grazing sheep? That's a good question. I really don't. Um, that is a concern, not necessarily, I'm not sure if I 
know your understanding the question completely, but you do need to be considerate of herbicide application to the primary crop as to whether your cover crop is going to do well or not. So that's more of an agronomy question. I'm not sure I can answer adequately, but uh, yeah, you want to make sure that there isn't some kind of carryover from that primary crop that's going to interfere with your cover crop growing. Um, so what size are my paddocks? Uh, in how many 164 foot nets? Okay, so you know, <laughs> 50 meter electro net. Yep. Um, you know, I find, you know, this is just my experience. So um, I think you could make bigger paddocks, but I'm most of my paddocks, I think right now are about two links. So whatever, two times 164, um, 328 feet, I guess, by, um, by three. So I'm using kind of two by three um, width fences for my paddocks. And I'm getting about 100 ewes and they're grazing about two weeks um, per two by three electro net length paddock right now. And that gives you some good practical um, thumbnail sketch there that, that that's what I can provide. Um, that seems to work pretty well. Um, what about grazing sheep and goats on the same pasture? Um, yeah, I think that can work. I think sometimes there's some dominance issues with goats, um, but certainly a lot of people are able to do that. And thanks everybody for tuning in tonight uh, and, and for the great questions. A lot of good interaction in the chat box. So we always appreciate that. Have a good night, everyone.